morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the third talk of the e-seminar series on translational biomedical engineering. Uh, these e-seminar series uh, are aimed to serve as a venue for uh, academic and uh, clinical researchers, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, regulatory officials, uh, patent experts, and investors uh, to discuss advances in uh, uh, trans advances and challenges in transitional uh, research uh, in the area of biomedical engineering. Uh, before uh, uh, we start today's talk, uh, there are a few housekeeping notes that I wanted to point out. Uh, this talk uh, will be recorded and uh, will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, the link will be sent to you in a follow-up email after the meeting. Uh, we notice that uh, sometimes uh, some of the participants they do not receive the emails in their mailbox. Please check your junk mail. Uh, a mail may be uh, uh, blocked by your uh, uh, browser, and it may be in your um, in your uh, uh, junk mail. Uh, if you have uh, any questions during the talk, please use the raise hand button or write your question in the question bar box. It's in the uh, you can find these uh, options in the uh, control panel on your right. Uh, uh, we will uh, send you a link to a survey uh, after this talk in a separate email. Uh, please make sure that you participate in the survey and provide your feedback to us uh, to improve these e-seminar series. Uh, we really appreciate your, uh, your feedback and we would like to improve uh, as much as we can. So, uh, 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 I. Uh, our next speaker is also uh, for 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 uh, next Wednesday is uh, uh, Dr. Hadi Shafiq, uh, uh, a professor from uh, the Division of uh, Engineering and Medicine and uh, Renal Division of Medicine uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital and uh, Harvard Medical School. He will be uh, talking about connected mobile health diagnostics for personalized uh, medicine. Uh, I also would like to thank our, uh, well, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, to email us or follow us on Twitter. We keep uh, updating of, uh, of all our information and then the, the news about these talks on our uh, Twitter account. Uh, uh, and again, our email, uh, the organizer's email addresses are also uh, here, so you can you can always uh, send us emails and uh, provide us with your feedback or if you have any questions. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, also thank uh, our sponsors, uh, Revolution, which is a, a biotech company that develops non-destructive contact-free mechanical testing devices for testing soft materials and uh, tissues. Uh, uh, we also would like to thank uh, Forum Biotech, which uh, develops smart wound dressing for management of uh, smart wound healing. So, with that, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce today's uh, speaker, Professor David Yanker, who will uh, give a talk on uh, recent advances in protein assay uh, technologies. Uh, Dr. Yanker is uh, is uh, the chair of biomedical engineering at uh, McGill University and is the Canada Research Chair in Bioengineering. Prior to joining McGill, he spent a year at ETH Zurich as a postdoctoral fellow. And before that, he did a PhD at IBM Zurich uh, Research uh, Laboratory. Uh, David's uh, current research interests are uh, the uh, engineering and utilization of my novel micro and nanotechnologies for manipulating, stimulating, and studying cells, proteins, and tissues. Uh, David uh, has published many papers, uh, and then he publishes in high-quality journals. He's, he's very, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, his research, any paper that comes out of his lab has the potential to become a technology uh, that can be commercialized. This is my opinion. Again, that's uh, uh, that's my opinion. Uh, uh, but but uh, David is going to. But he is in general is very good in developing transitional technologies in his lab. To my best knowledge, he has uh, uh, his research so far has led to three uh, uh, spin-ups. 
So he knows a lot about the nuts and bolts of uh, transactional research, uh, especially in biomedical engineering. David, thank you very much for accepting our invitation uh, to give a talk here today at uh, our e-seminar series. The virtual floor is now yours. Okay, well, Mohsen, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this. It's very exciting for the field, I think, to have this, this opportunity to, to kind of rally around and, and meet one another in a virtual way. Having, oh, show my screen. Yes, show my screen. You want to see my screen? I uh, hope this is going to work. So then, uh, we have to make you, uh, so David, we have to make you a presenter. Uh, yeah. So maybe okay. you, should, you should do that. Oh, man. There you go. I did this okay. presenter. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Okay, do I have to? Okay, I have to press again. I don't know. Stop. No one sees your screen. Can you see my? Which screen can you see? Can Not you yet. see my presentation? Not yet, David. We saw it before. Oh, there yes. you go. We can. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you see, you see the presentation. Yes. We see your presentation. Okay. Slide through. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you so much, and also thank you for organizing this uh, this uh, seminar series. It's that's I think it's a fantastic opportunity to to bring the community together and actually address uh, the translation, which is certainly at, at the heart of many of our interests. And I will come back to that. Uh, I, I think one of the challenges is yeah I cannot see the faces of the audience only of uh, Mosen and Human, so reading from their expression I will take that as a proxy for the general audience. So if there uh, is something uh, on the chat or on the questions you see, please let me know so I can adjust uh, in time. Yeah. Uh, and but yeah, and, and then also I know the, re the the talk is recorded. So so I I uh, I, mean, I I started this I gave them a talk a while ago before I had thought too much about what I was only going to present. And then I came to understand this was more to be focused on the translational aspect. And so uh, so I, I, I tried to readjust a little bit and expand a bit the scope, not just the technology, but really the bigger perspective. And I hope that will be the also of interest. But so, and so we'll jump right in. And, and it's the first time I'm presenting, so I hope I'll, I'll make it, uh, I'll, I'll be within the time limits and everything will go well. And that this will be also interesting. Um, okay, so just briefly, up. It's going to be too fast briefly to start. So uh, we are from Montreal, McGill. So this is a university here. So I uh, outlined the campus in red. So we're a fantastic location. Uh, I'm the chair of the biomedical engineering department. I don't know if you can you guys see my mouse when I do that. We yes. can. So which is situated around here. All right. And, and here my office here. I can see on the on the football or soccer field here. That is here our football field, depending if you're European. Uh, and so it's a wonderful place and we're actually right downtown here in Montreal where you have access to all the restaurants and, and the metro and the communication. And uh, beyond that, so my lab in particular, so we have quite a diverse lab. I think we are, so Mossen made uh, some uh, nice, gave me some nice accolades. I, I'll try to meet his expectations today. But so we have been developing a very, we've been really driving new ideas and, and many of them are technology driven. And so these are some of them. And, and if you wanna learn more, please go to the web page. As I think given the time constraint, I won't really explain much about this today. Uh, I think the first thing I wanna say is already acknowledge all the people here. So you know, this is, I mean, I'm the one presenting, but uh, part will be about really the work. And so we have a fantastic group. I think we have a great, and I, I, we have been promoting a great lab atmosphere where people help one another. And I think this has been one, really one of the qualities. And so here are other pictures from Montreal, from uh, from the Mount Royal, which we saw, so the mountain which we saw before. And of course, as we are in the middle of summer, winter here is not far. So Montreal is a great place for all seasons. Um, then. In terms of spin-offs, since this is kind of the focus of our talk, I tried to think back. So there have been actually four spin-offs from the lab, uh, and they were all led by students. I mean, one of them didn't last very long, and so I won't really talk much about them. Mina devices, but we have Sensorial, which was I think the first one, and then Parallax, which is also active, and I'll speak about a little bit about them as well. And then Enplex Biosciences, which uh, I'm also a co-founder and advisor. So I have also conflict of interest here. Um, which uh, which is uh, actually just starting and, and, and getting up to speed. And so I'll weave them into my presentation. 
But before going uh, too much into this thought, I, I want to step a little bit back and also tell a bit my, uh, take my biomedical engineering chair hat and this kind of a discussion we've had too, what, what is the role of biomedical engineering? Why are we in biomedical engineering? And I think translation is really one of the big outcomes or, 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 or applications that, that sets biomedical engineering apart. And so if I think of it, so biomedical engineering, we have really two impacts, and that's one of the things I want to maybe also emphasize today. On one hand, we have this idea of healthcare where we can make an impact in healthcare, which I think is, is, is very clear. And also from the, from the activities of Mossen and Human and maybe the previous speaker, this is where many of people are very active. But, but biomedical engineering is also a tool development for technologies that can be used in the biosciences, so for, for basic science research. And, and, we'll, and, and I think actually both of these activities are really uh, cross-fertilizing and, and helping. And, and in particular, biomedical engineering is really at the core of linking these activities or these fields together. And so that's, that's kind of realized by this infinity loop where we are sitting here and can connect all of that. And so if you look at the healthcare side, maybe, how do we, how do we go? And, and maybe I, I wrote it as challenge, so it starts at the bottom here. Maybe it's more a need also, we could think about it. We have healthcare needs. I mean, there's enormous healthcare needs, both in terms of things we cannot do, in terms of sustainability, in terms of making them lower cost. And, and biomedical engineering is coming in really to address these needs and to through, and that's maybe that sets apart from many of the science here, to invention, design and development of new technologies, which then we can, if they're working well, take to clinical translation and eventually to have a health impact. And now beyond, and so on one hand we're publishing, but I think what motivates us often to come to biomedical engineering, maybe as opposed to other engineering fields, is that we want to help uh, our fellow uh, humans and healthcare is one way where we can help them. Now, to, to do this final translation, often this is not something we can do from the lab, and that's where we, of course, need, for example, spin-offs, which is what we need, and as well partnerships. And the partners, of course, are clinicians, our industry, investors, and regulatory agencies, which are all then come in as part of the way to help us make this health impact. If you look now on the other side a bit of this approach, we also have biosciences, and, and in biosciences, we have a lot of challenges. We want to make maybe better imaging. We want to be able to uh, to make organ on chips, uh, which no, they're not direct clinical application. And and so we have some things that are incremental or some maybe grand challenges that we can think about. And here also again, biomedical engineer is at the core in inventing, designing, and developing these new tools. And you know, and as also, and biomedical engineering also evolves together with the biosciences. So as now we go much more into molecular fields, for example, genetic engineering or immunoengineering, you know, molecular tools and design. So they, they were initially driven by scientists, but now as we know more about them, the concepts of design, of, of mod optimization apply to them and they really become also areas for engineering. And so once then we develop these tools, we can then deploy them in the lab. And if they become developed, they can drive scientific discoveries and again, for wider adoption, spin-off, partnerships have a very important aspect here. And, and scientific discoveries, again, of course, give us new ideas on how we can maybe address some of the healthcare need. And so they feed back into this loop. And so I think that's one of the power and the opportunities for biomedical engineering here to be at the core of this. Um, and then if we go to further, so if, if we look a bit at what, what these things look like here, in terms of, of what there are. So if you look at the healthcare side, it's more medical devices, therapeutics and biotechnology. I mean, so I say like nanomedicine approaches or, or which, which are coming to the fore or antibody engineering nowadays, imaging devices, maybe more at the human scale or larger scale. And of course, also diagnostics. On the, on the other side, we have on the scientific discovery side, it's more laboratory tools, imaging and microscopy or instrumentation. And so if we think about translation and, and also the commercialization, I mean, we have a very, we have quite different challenges and opportunities there. And so if we look on the right side, we have, or we have, we have a, uh, uh, a trade off on one hand between the speed which we can go to the market and the size on the market. So on the left side, if you research tool, you typically have smart, smaller markets, but you don't have regulatory approval uh, obstacles. And, and that's often a very big challenge is, and for me, for example, we have we're working in diagnostics where there's less uh, there's less return on investments, and where you still have the five or six year delay to get potentially regulatory approval. This can be very difficult to get uh, investment. Of course, if you're able to take that that step, you can potentially have a much larger market size. 
but this comes at the cost of a large of a of a, of a large uh, death valley and where you need external financing and so that's something to consider also when you think about your research i mean a lot of people are working in tissue engineering and we maybe think about applications but tissue engineering could for example be also for organ on a chip and if you want to do them for organ on a chip there's actually a lot of bioscientists or biomedical researchers who could be very interested in these tools and who will then prevent you or, or circumvent the need for regulatory approval in the beginning. And so if we look then at, uh, at our lab, I think our lab also sits a bit into the center here where we both have diagnostic, where we think they could have healthcare application. And on the other side, also a lot of technologies where we think about technology that can be transformative in the sense that they can expand the ability for for bioanalytical applications and 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 in terms of transformative technologies there have been of course many examples i mean if you think microscopy also engineering approaches that help that or as or or for example sequencing where uh, where these are also technology driven new tools that could really transform actually uh, the, the the our understanding of what science is and also have eventually a clinical impact and i'll come back to this example a bit later and so the companies that we have had, they have so sensor real started and has been most focused on, on trying to make a health impact, trying to get a diagnostic. And I'm saying trying here because they are, they don't have a product on the market as it stands today. They have had success and I will discuss them. But this has been, of course, a challenge. And again, diagnostic, there's lots of diagnostics available. So what can you really bring in that field? The two other companies, they have been starting in this biosciences area. We're making tools, tools for research. And these tools, they can also be for research, but they can also be for other customers. And maybe what some of the other customers we think less about are pharma. And, and one of the things I want to talk about is really NPLEX, so, um, where we make this, and I will see them later, is proteomics approaches. And this is something that, for example, can be using the drug delivery process. So they want to find new drugs and how they respond. And so if you can team up with a pharma and help them bring a drug to market, then they, you can basically work with them to then go and address some health care challenge, or maybe have a new therapy out of that. And where you can then help ride with them this, this opportunity by, for example, becoming companion diagnostic that then helps define who might have this drug, whether the dosage of the drug is right. And so then they can help you basically uh, bridge that gap. Another way to look at it is that if you have a technology that's really transformative and groundbreaking, you, you, you will start in the biosciences. And as this becomes adopted, and this is the case of sequencing, this really started out as a research tool. But nowadays we see sequencing having huge impact in healthcare, being for neonatal screening, where they do the sequencing in the blood for mothers. That was probably the first one. But and also now in all, all terms of precision medicine, uh, where, where they can help us guide the best therapy. And so they started in bioscience, and, but then they, they triggered and catalyzed a new field that developed. And then, of course, you can help and transition also into this healthcare aspect. Of course, this is a more long-term type of vision. And so <clears throat> then I, uh, I'm going to come back a bit more to what our lab and the, 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 the practical thing. And maybe the first thing is I, I, I framed my discussion as simplicity and, and scalability. So the first thing I'll, I'll discuss maybe is under the context of simplicity. And so simplicity. In the context of lab on a chip, so lab on a chip, we have about 25 years, I and mean, this has been one of the main areas of my lab. And a lot of the lab on a chips, how we think about it, I mean, they start with external pump, and then you have electrokinetic pumping, which is very popular in the end of the 90s. Then centrifugal microfluidic, which started in the 90s, and then like it waned a bit, and now it's becoming popular again. So this is a commercial product here from a Quebec company. Or which is now by BD, multi-layer soft discography early 2000s and digital microfluidics, which came a bit after, and now the other forms of, of uh, droplet microfluidics, which are driving the field. And so now we have had a major crisis coming up in, in recently, and that was a COVID-19 emergency. And there has been a persistent unmet need for diagnosis, both viral infection and antibody response. And so this is and so we've had lineup for testing here in Montreal in early March in winter. And just like a few days ago, again, there was a, people went back to bars and a lot of people have potentially infected. So they encouraged everyone to go test and people actually responded, which was very positive. But then the result was that they had to line up four or five hours in the streets to try to get tested. And so we would think that you no know, lab on a chip is one of the visions was to make this point of care devices. And so how, how do lab on a chip contribute to that? And they have been indeed important advances in particular for molecular tests. I mean, we have for COVID-19 
the viral direct detection, which is largely driven by RNA detection. And for this, we have now commercial tests available, like this uh, COVID-19, the, the Abbott test here, the ID now, or a Canadian development Spartan, which, which has had some troubles too. But in both cases, these tests don't really circumvent many of the challenges. I mean, you, you still have to have a nurse with personal protective equipment to collect your, your spatial or nasal swab, which is also unpleasant. The patient must go to this test site. And ultimately, this throughput is extremely limited for these tests. I mean, for the current uh, clinical tests, they're done in 96 well plates, so they take much longer, but they can use multiple tests in parallel, and the instrumentation can basically uh, is, is, uh, is, 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 is in high throughput. Whereas here, the test is much faster, five minutes for a positive test if you have a high viral titer for, for the Abbott instrument, but it's one test at a time. So when you have pe hundreds of people lining up, this would require rooms full of these chaps. And so these tests have a really minimal impact, at least here in Canada, in terms of, 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 of testing, despite their potential. Uh, their potential. And so the, 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 so what we see with Lab on a Chip, where they have, I mean, they have succeeded in many ways and they have really have tremendous advances, but what's really is limiting them is that still we are in a mode where the peripherals and the lab around the chip is actually much larger than the chip. It's not a self-contained type of device. And so the one technology that has had an impact now in COVID-19 and both in positive and also in some negative headlines are what we call, could also be called rapid myelocrophilic tests, but are the lateral flow devices. And we all know them from the pregnancy tests and following the pandemic. I mean, they, the, the first was, of course, we had the nucleic uh, sequence available, but very quickly people developed them for antibody-based testing into this type of test. And this is a technology that goes back to 1956, so it's 70 years old. But of course, it's, it's simple, and, and that's really one of the, the highly mark, highlights here. Inexpensive, very established, there's all the production manufacturing there, and it gives a yes, no answer. For example, in the case of an antibody test, it's probably sufficient in the first phase. The disadvantages are relatively large, uh, qualitative results. They lack sensitivity and specificity. So especially early on, many of these tests were not working. So the, U, the UK government spent $2 million or or, or, or pounds or more to buy these tests and which turned out to have a very poor sensitivity and specificity. And some of that was maybe just due to poor uh, quality control and, and the rapid response so that people were trying cutting some, some, uh, some corners, but maybe some of it is also, and we're seeing that still maybe to, to uh, a more limited sensitivity and specificity than some of the laboratory tests. And so whereas they had the benefit of user friendliness so that you, know, you could send these tests or people could do it fairly easily, or even a nurse can run multiple tests in parallel, even without having much instrumentation, they have had limitation. And but what maybe, what, what, and where we wanna maybe segue here to our work is that these tests work with capillary flow. And so we all know capillary flow from the paper wipes where liquid is being drawn into the system. And capillary flow uh, is what powers these tests. And capillary flow is also something that we can do in a, in a microfluidic tone and uh, context. And the benefits of capillary flow and, and these tests is that they're simple to use, simple to manufacture. They don't require any peripheral equipment. And you know, cell phones maybe nowadays we have we see that cell phones are becoming a, a tool to quantity to make instead of qualitative quantitative tests. But what we see so far is really simplicity comes basically at the expense of performance, and that's basically the challenge that we would like maybe to address. And as I was alluding, so microfluidics, we can have capillary flow in microfluidics. And the challenge here is that uh, we can see this as kind of a passive system. That's the way we think about it and that they have been labeled. So it's very simple and you know, you put the sample and then it flows and that's really what the lateral flow tests do. And so what has inspired us in the lab and, and that's something that goes back to my PhD is that there are actually systems that are driven by capillary flow and are, that some degree are simple. I mean, you can, and here I'm referring to trees, they are kind of simple, they're very passive in some ways, but they're also actually living systems. And, and they are, they're not just passive, they're actually self-powered, they are self-regulated and they're fairly complex. In winter, they lose their leaves. In summer, they grow back and they restart the flow and, and they really embody an autonomous system in the sense that it's, it's, uh, it's really self-powered and it's self-regulated. So they have both of these aspects, which is, I think, which is a the basic definition of an autonomous system. And this is actually what, what inspired a lot of my PhD work in trying to make these systems more advanced and what something we have developed in the lab and which is, was, was the foundation for one of the technologies. And so over the years, we have been pushing this further into making these so-called passive systems actually smart and, and more advanced. And this is an example from the cover 
uh, of a lab on a chip where we developed, where we have on the left you have the, the structure and on the right you have this the structure that with the, the symbolic representation of the different functions that are encoded. And we, are, we, are, we have taken this an analogy from electronics here where we represent the different parts as, as in, in symbolic way in the same you would rep represent electronic elements such as resistor, capacitance and power supplies. And, and so we also coined a new name and we call this capillarix with the idea of like electronics. You have capillarix stands for the idea of, of a circuit of an engineering system in contrast to, for example, elect electrical forces. So you have electrical phenomena, which is more the physical phenomena, and electronics is more the engineering system and the design approach for this. And also the concept that you can build up complex circuits from a library of basic capillary elements in a symbolic or capillary components, if you think about a practical way. And so this can then be represented in this type of context here, where now you have these circuits in, in a schematic layout and then in a symbolic layout, and this allows you to make more complex approaches. And to show you an example of now how we can use that to, to control the flow better, and without going too much into the details here, here is a, one of our uh, capillary circuits from a few years ago. We pre-fill, in this case, different regions, and we control the capillary forces in a certain way so that we can regulate the, the delivery of different liquids. And the way this works, and the analogy, is, I, it's, it's like a force. We have to control the capillary force. And so we're using here uh, an analogy to Star Wars, which also has a lot of use of the force. And so this is a large reservoir and the capillary force, the capillary force scales inversely to the dimension. So it's very large. And this is a retention force. So it's like Anakin at before, you know, as, uh, when he is a junior, he has the force, but he doesn't really know how to control it. Then he becomes a Padawan, he starts to train, so he has a better force. He graduates, so he's, he now masters the force, but he still realizes something escapes him. And so he starts turning to the dark side and eventually becomes Darth Vader, which then has a great, man, a, a great power. And so if now we have these people, and this is like a hydraulic system, so they're all pulling at each of these ends. So if they're all pulled together, and the logic of this circuit is that everyone is pulling together, and now we start it, what will happen the first is like a, a tug of war type of, of system where we have five or six people pulling at the same time on a liquid. What happens is of course that's the weakest one is the first to break. And this is here, the young Anakin. And so this liquid is the first one to flow. And this is our reaction chamber. And here is where the reaction happens. So we have near, in this case, our sample that would flow through this reaction chamber. And once this is empty, well, here is done. Then the next one to, to break is, is this one. And then this one. And then finally this one. And so the winner here is of course a dark force, but oh, behold, actually here we have a retention system that is even stronger that holds the liquid back so we don't have drying effect. And I think this is, this is the last Jedi that comes to save uh, our system here. And so this is maybe a way that you remember this, but, and, and it's a bit in a, in a funny manner. So, but so basically the, the, the concept is that we can program these different forces and program the multiple fluidic operations into this system without any external intervention. And in this case, we applied this system for a rapid bacteria detection, which was done uh, with, with collaborators at the hospital. And uh, we actually, we're still working on that. We did quite a lot of progress uh, and we we're actually moving. And so the first one was done with fluorescence and we're moving towards a system that can be done, uh, that it can be read out by eye. And, and but this technology was basically the foundation for sensor reel. And uh, this was Ruzbe who uh, pioneered this work. And actually Kate and Alessandro were also alumni from the lab. So they all joined this company and they have been developing this in parallel to us for many years. And we also worked and supported them. And uh, I think the, the big success they had is, uh, I don't know if you can hear the sound here, is that they had shaped, they got a contract from the Canadian Space Agency together with Honeywell to develop a chip, which is a similar technology to what I showed you, but this is produced in a polymer and has an inlet that was then sent to the International Space Station, where then had the Honeywell reader and David Saint Jack, the Canadian astronaut, basically used their platform, which successfully worked in space, so they could have actually a test readout for a multiplex amino assay in space, which I think was the first time that it was done uh, in space. And so that has been a big success for them and uh, and helped them basically uh, develop this further. And, and demonstrate that actually this technology addressing a lot of the challenges. I will come back to that in a minute. However, what so so sensory went out to start to make a health impact, and this has been indeed very difficult. And so they went back into now a mode, not really scientific, to some more uh, a laboratory or, or a test tool for space. Of course, very 
uh, a very uh, impressive demonstration, but they haven't had taken this step or didn't get regulatory approval yet. And so, so to some end, they're also partnering as an OEM manufacturer where maybe they're teaming up with others. And so there's, I'm not aware of all this. And so they have also these other successes, but but yeah, it, 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 and, and, and some of these might be a way for them to, to also turn into the healthcare. But to, on the other hand, they have been giving up the lead on these products where now they become basically a supplier in this thing. And, and of course, that's also maybe a way of being successful in this platform because that's a way of they can have this new technology impact actually many more people rather than just have one thing. But so where we saw that we could still contribute in taking this forward, and this is where I uh, talk where we have been a bit our latest work, where so sensory was really very much based on microfabrication based technology but in the last few months we have switched to a cap to, to 3d printing and 3d printing really has transformed our way because now we can have this fast turnaround and here we're using stereostography printing that allows us to rapidly print and so where in the past we had 10 micrometer feature now they are 200 micrometer feature and in the beginning we had major questions whether this might still work but it turned out that actually this works really well still for capillary effects and so now we can, like where in the past we had months to have a design cycle and with capillary circuits, you know, they're very easy to use, but they're actually very hard to design. And when you design them and you have three months and then you test it and it fails because one little design was worrying, then you have to go through these cycles. And so the cycle times are very limiting. Now we can do the same thing basically in half an hour. And so we have very new opportunities. And so the new type of technology we're having here is shown here. And so this is now a new generation of chip where now we have actually buffer filling. So we fill at once many buffers, which will be rinsing steps. So this now replicates much more elaborate tests like in ELISA, where they have all these rinsing steps. And this is one way you can enhance sensitivity and specificity. And so we pre-fill and then we have different reagents. And here we will now deliver 10 reagents. So here's the sample. So we still have some manual operations here, then a rinsing buffer, then an antibody, another rinsing buffer, then a signal amplification, another reagent, a, a rinsing buffer, and the final rinsing. So we can have a much more complicated operation than previously here even, and add additional steps, as well as, for example, signal amplification that allow us to do by eye readout. And so we were working actually this for bacterial detection, but then indeed COVID-19 hit. And so we were then faced with the same challenges. And, and so we said, can we use this technology to start to think about addressing the diagnostic need for COVID-19? And so our vision was then that we could use these tests where instead of doing now this uh, viral detection or antibody detection using blood, and especially for viral detection using the nasal swab, we could maybe do this in saliva. And there are already reports that show that saliva is indeed a suitable sample. Also, there's still some questions about which type of saliva but we could see that this could be adapted and so that you could then do it at home, test your thing, run it through your chip and basically use your cell phone as a signal readout and of course then into the cloud platform connect to the uh, healthcare provider. So this would of course remove a lot of the bottleneck. You could just have these things mailed to you, for example, or pick it up in a pharmacy. And so that's what we set out to do. So this is the type of technology developed and this is a saliva base. So we have we've been working with saliva now. We, we have not with real patients, but we, we spiked in sample. And this essentially is a test where you have the sample, washing, reagent one, washing, reagent two, washing, reagent three, and then several washing steps, like in the video I showed you before. And to just show some preliminary results, this is a, the binding curve using a scanner, which is the images shown here on top, and the same images taken with a cell phone here. And so it demonstrates that we can indeed detect this thing. We can obtain quantitative results and we get uh, some re reduced limit of detection. So this is antibody detection, but we still maintain a, what I believe is a very high sensitivity. So we'll need now the next step is to redo the, the calibration and comparison to common lateral flow test and, and, and validate that this can be more sensitive and specific, especially for cases where, where some people have cross reactivity where we see that this washing, at least in, in some of our, our own experiments, the washing can really help eliminate some of these cross-reactivity effects. And so to the challenge then to next translation is that we need to solve surface chemistry, reagent storage with sensor reel already solved these uh, challenges in their previous technology. So there are solutions for that. Cell phone apps for the readout. Again, these are things that are already exist. It's more about adapting them to us and we then need to manufacture them and scale them up. And so there we still need to translate from 3D printing using to injection molding because for regulatory approval, we'll need something with type control. And, uh, and, and then of course, go through the regulatory approval uh, approach. And here, I mean, you know, in a bit cynical way also, 
COVID-19 is an opportunity for many people, of course, because now you can have emergency use approval. And this is, of course, where you can have quickly an approval for a technology, which normally takes several years. You can get that in several months. The same goes for ethics approval. All these things you have actually the chance to actually have them approved. And of course, this can also ultimately also help patients. And so that's the, 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 where we are, and so that's where we're working now. And I want to thank you. I, mean, I didn't have time to put all the, the face for the team, but really the, the team in the lab rallied around this, and so have been really pushing this. And Oriol, in particular, and as well as many of the other members, have actually been really critical in pushing this forward. And so from here, I want to then switch gear to the second vignette here, and I think, uh, uh, which is scalability, and uh, and I'll try to kind of keep moving as, as time is already flowing. And so the scalability is, so we have an issue also with manufacturing for the microfluidic, but scalability in terms of uh, analysis can also be an issue. And scalability is one thing that I was very sensitized to when I did my PhD work at IBM, because IBM was making computer processors at that time. And as you know, we had a rapid progression in computer power, which has had, which progressed according to what is known as Moore's law, where you have a linear scale in years, and an exponential scale here in terms of transistors. And, a linear representation here. And this is what has driven the power of computation. And I'm sorry the scale stops in 2012 here because I kind of stopped following it at some point. But it has gone on for a while and it's actually it's actually flattening out to some degree and, and also basically some mobile phones are picking up instead of computers obviously. But this is really what transformed society and, and the fact that we have Facebook and these things is because we have this computational power in our phones nowadays. Now this transformation has been for computation, but the same transformation took care in biosciences. And first they came through DNA microarrays, which had a growth that was much faster than computational power and which installed out. And there's multiple reasons for that, but one of the reasons why it stalled out because a new technology came around, which was called sequencing. And so sequencing is now the mainstream of DNA analysis or DNA or an RNA. And they have had an explosive growth that outpaced computational science, uh, the computational transistor numbers in, in a massive way. And this has had, of course, tremendous impact in terms of genome sequencing, where we had the first human genome cost 2.7 billion, and so that was the reference. And then once you start that, you could do it in 100 million with conventional technologies. But then when next generation sequencing came around, sorry, here, it's going the other way around, uh, here, the, 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 the throughput uh, increased dramatically here in terms of the cost, the, the throughput increased and the cost decreased dramatically. And of course, the data generated. So, whereas you do a few people here, now you start to deploy it on a large scale. And the data actually become a limitation as, as the computational power is not growing as fast. So, data processing became actually a big bottleneck in many of these approaches. And this has transformed genomics, but really has transformed the way we think about healthcare. We, I mean, there, there, there was, of course, promises done after the human genome, and some of them have not been fulfilled because actually it's much more complex than when we thought. And part of this complexity is, is now reflected in proteomics and microbiomics and, and genomics and all the different levels of genomics. But they have transformed the way we think about healthcare and, and give rise to concepts like precision medicine or personalized medicine in ways that we didn't envision. Now, I said one, my title was about protein assays, and so we saw protein assays with microfluidics. But protein assays is also something that was starting a scale up. And actually, the protein assay technology, the first one started also in the early 90s a single binder assay, almost at the same time the DNA, but the scaling there has been a bit more modest, just up to 2012, about up to 1,000 or 3,000 assays. And then you have another technology for high performance assays, sandwich assays, which started even earlier here, actually even earlier than DNA microarrays in 1988, which scaled up to 92 in a matter of 20 years. So you know, where sequencing went from, uh, from 10 to 10 to the 12, protein assays went from four to 90, to put that on a scale. And over the last few years, maybe you'll tell me, well, this has really changed. It did change a little bit. So for single binder assay, we have companies like Somalogic, which now do four or 5,000. They have had profound impact. So now there's lots of nature papers coming out using these types of technologies. And we have also sandwich assays, which went from 92 to just this year to 384 per reaction, and which are also now being deployed and very interesting. And, and the reason for that is also because sequencing now, genes are one thing. The, every gene is encodes for a protein. So you do a sequencing run, and then you want to you analyze billions of sequences and all your variants, and then you want to understand what's going on in biology. It's the protein is the effector of that gene, and then you go back to ELISA, mostly one protein at a time. And so this was actually the, 
So ELISA are still the one assay at the time, still the most used assay in, in, in protein assays. And of course, people have been trying to do this, this multiplexed assay, but what has prevented them in high performance assay, like sandwich assays, so which is the basis for ELISA, is this antibodies mixtures cross react. So when you have all these antibodies together, is that so ELISA is used to get high performance, but then the reagents you add and mix together, they actually stick to one another. And so the problem with that is the more targets you add, so if you have few targets, so each target is a combinatorial game, and so roughly this scales as 4n square. So if you have 10 targets, n square, 100, 400 liability. And so, you know, this becomes difficult to interact because you change one of them, it could screw, it could, could destroy all the other assets. If you do 100 assays, this becomes 40,000, and that's something that becomes in management. That's why actually these assays were not scaled up in a way beyond a few tens. And this is something we outlined, and it's, uh, it's something actually observed in my PhD, and we, we referred into this uh, approach, and something when we set out to address in the lab in 2005, and our approach was colocalization, where we did this multiplexed assay on a microarray, but instead of just arraying the, the bottom antibodies in a microarray and then applying all the detection antibodies as a mixer, we also arrayed these antibodies one by one. And that's what we call the antibody colocalization microarray, and there were two iterations for that, one by conventional spotting, and one so that it could also be used by an end user where we pre-spotted all the assays here and then snapped them together in what we call a snap chip. And so this could then make that we would do the manufacturing on one side, oops, why is this running by itself now? And then the end user would do it. And so that was the first company. And so this work, still a lot of manufacturing challenge and also because we're using slides and we found out that slide quality is very difficult. So if you wanna have good results, you might need to manufacture your own slide. And this will become very painful. And so that's what led us basically to start and think about another approach. And the other approach we were thinking about is flow cytometry. And so they had actually been widely used as, as multiplexed assays. And the advantages were beads have no edges. So every bead is actually equivalent to the other. So you have no spatial inhomogeneity. So you have 10,000 beads. You get very statistics really placed into your hand. Whereas in a microarray, the spot at the edge is not the same as the spot in the middle. And the center of your spot is not the same than the edge of your spot. It's a very fundamental difference here. So beads are equivalent replicates, flow cytometers are widely available, they're high throughput, 10,000 beads per second is very standard. And in bead, you have actually better binding kinetics. Now, why this hasn't been more successful? Because the cross-reactivity has been addressed in this bead, the one I just outlined. And so we set out how can we address that, and we tried a bunch of things. And the solution we came up is what we call colocalization by linkage assay on a microparticle, where we use oligo-functionalized antibodies that we pre-hybridize on the beads so that they actually don't mix. And this is shown here in this thing here where we have the antibodies that are hybridized. We then incubate with the sample, the assay. So it's really different from conventional assay, right? The, all the reagents are already prepackaged. So we, we add more intelligence in the assay instead of adding it after. The assay runs, we wash, and then we add an oligo. So this is a DNA programmable aspect to displace it. And so this displaces, so if the DNA oligo hy hybridizes and displaces it, and stays, then we'll have a fluorescent signal because this is the fluorophore here. And if not, then we'll actually not get a signal. And this is actually where we're looking someone to develop this first and we have some success, but this is a complex platform, complex technology actually. I mean, I won't go into the details and this can address, uh, overcome some of these challenges. On a side row, and this is a side show, but it was actually very fundamental too. We also, and this was the Milad who did this PhD, developed, so we, had, we needed beads and the barcode is beads, they were very expensive, so let's say our own. And this was a rabbit story, but we developed the new chemistry, we developed the FRET model, fluorescence resonance energy transfer and the automated decoding, which now allows us using very simple approaches to make very high content barcodes. And so here, and that's really, that's actually the, the, we had 500 and the company now developed up to 1150 barcodes. So this is really highly scalable. And so basically it's these ideas that Milad, uh, Jeff, Aria and I to found this company. So Milad redeveloped the founded technology and then reached for, I mean, and developed this as a, as a commercialization platform. And so we've had some early investors and also some successes in terms of getting funding. And so the, the clamp that I mentioned is called as N ELISA. So it's one ELISA, but with N beads. So this N plex, which then becomes the N ELISA. And so this is basically, you take any sample, you have the standard typical assay protocols using robotics, you take any cytometer, and then you have a fully automated workflow. So it's, it's simple in the sense that it uses existing technology I and mean, it's still complex that you need these robotics. 
and it's scalable. We have thousand barcodes, and if we add other colors, so in the cytometer we could even increase that much further. Then the offering. So what we think in the way of we see ourselves, this is kind of the competitive landscape. We started here. This is where we're here today. So we want to have high content assay and high throughput without sacrificing performance, which has been the, 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 the sense in the past, and also at low cost, which I think is really where we can have a, a unique offering in terms of market. And so that's where we're at, and so that's where we're now pushing, and so there's still partnership between the lab and, and NPLEX going on. And uh, so to, to kind of conclude, and I'll see we're running a bit late in time, so I'll, maybe we'll see how uh, a few points and insights and lessons learned, as I said. I mean, I had children also that were, or a family that grew while this was started. So as, I, as much as I would have liked to be more involved in the commercialization and, and, and the, 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 the launching of the company, I had some limitations, but I think I can provide some insights both to PIs and maybe some of the students of the challenges of that, that, that are there. And so one of them is how to develop maybe a good idea, right? When you want to commercialize some of the things. And so, so some of the experience that we have had and, and so we thought about, and maybe also in hints, I think of something impossible that's needed, right? So lab on a chip, I mean, this was something impossible, make the lab on a chip. And, and well, we, we tried to do it, and I mean, someone, someone we ignored a little bit the ladder flow assays, which already did it, but with some limitation, we came up with new ideas, but they haven't been really possible. And so we then, building on capillary forces, tried to do that. In the beginning, we didn't think about it, but now we have actually developed a platform where we can really think of, of encoding all this functionality to the chip. All the proteomics was an idea. And, and if we think about that, gain inspiration from other fields is unsuccessful. So, so genomics has really, and there is also, so those computers and genomics had this scalability was very important. So it's not just about making something that's radical, but something that's really scalable and, and that can be deployed. And of course, nowadays with software, we see that something that's very easy. You make a new app and it's immediately deployable, but when you're manufacturing, this is a very fundamental question or, or, or in assays in terms of scaling up. But so can we do that for proteomics and how can we do this, right? And so this were some of our e efforts. And, and, and part of that was really identifying the problem. So why can proteomics be scaled? And, and this requires that you re develop expertise in area because the, <clears throat> when you're from the outside, you know, people hide these problems. These multiplex companies that sell you kits, they're very happy that there are cross reactivity problems because they still sell you many, many different kits that don't work. And then you buy all the different kits from them and they make more money. And so for us, it was really understanding where this country are cross-reactivity is, and, and there were the challenges is in identifying really a simple solution. It's a simple solution to complex problems. Just every problem you have, they look complex from the outset, right? But once the solution is there, after it's obvious, of course, right? So, you know, you need to heat water. You know, if you're, uh, well, you make fire for that, of course, and once you can do fire, this is obvious, but before you were able to manage fire, this was a really complex problem. And so part is brainstorming, part is having fun, and part is failing. So, and, and, and there it's on one hand, you have to be tenacious, so you have to be able to fail, but sometimes you also have to learn how to let go. I mean, you know, we, we went with the, with the slide and we did a lot of inroad, but, uh, and, and I think this is still a promising platform and there could be some opportunities, but on the other hand, there are also very fundamental problems that I thought maybe we can do something better with speed. And so that's what motivated us early on, even before uh, that, that we knew whether this would be commercial success or not, that we started to work with the beads. And part of it is also just serendipity. Sometimes things show up and that's where also you now being prepared and being, having to think, be ready so that you have this expertise that when you see something that could actually help you, that you can also then identify the solution. A very important aspect there is intellectual property. And so intellectual property is the first step. And one thing realizing, and one thing also the venture capitalists will tell you very strongly is that this is just the first step. You know, and of course, as an inventor, you're very essential for the people who put the money, they don't like to tell you that you're that essential because of the, they, they don't have to give you that much resources for that. Having said that, so you, you know, it's, it's a bit our culture that of course they, the one, I mean, so, so it depends where you're at. If you already have successes and your thing is demonstrated, then you can have a strong leverage if you already have income. If you're very early on without demonstration, then you know they have probably a stronger leverage because you depend on their money. So that's that's kind of the bargaining too. So IP when to file. I mean, one of the things and where to file. So when you file initially, it's cheap. When you want to go to all the countries, it's very expensive. So once you file, the clock starts ticking. Right? We can file in, a, in here, 
then uh, you have like one, two years where you have to decide which country, and then it becomes very expensive. And, and developing these technologies can take time. So typically in academia, the recommendation is to file as late as possible. So before you disseminate the idea, that's where you want to file it, just at the same time. And maybe you file a provisional, which then you can define an international patent if this becomes successful. The risk is, of course, that someone can file in the meantime and steal your idea. So that's, you have to balance that risk. And so there's a risk management there. And so, for example, we have had failed IP. So my first IP on patent on capillary flow was declined by IBM. And the patent lawyer came back and said, you know, capillary, so he, he didn't understand the concept between capillary flow and, and capillary. And so he said, yeah, capillaries exist. I don't know what's different. Capillary is already there. It's kind of one of the motivations maybe to invent a new word because we really suffered from that. Another issue is that their bandwidth. I mean, when we had an IP in McGill, we started and then we had to adjust it, but then I didn't have time. The students didn't know. The patent attorney, he's basically paid in McGill on a fixed rate. So if he does a good job or not such a good job, it's the same outcome for him. And this patent was actually bungled. And in the end, we kind of lost it. So it, was, it was just became too expensive. I mean, you can, you know, it was declined. You, you have the option to call the examiner, but this is charged like, I don't know, $200 for five minutes or something like that. So if you want to have a call, it's good to a thousand dollars. And then is it worse to fork that out and, and the energy that you'd have to do? So, so then, then that kind of died. Uh, and finding IP within your university is, can be, you know, if you're in a university, you probably need to file with the university. Uh, and you can cut the uh, thing, you, know, you at least require officially to do so. And if you're a faculty, you probably have no choice. So it's important to have a good relationship with Office because they will evaluate you. They have protocols. Uh, be aware of what's the rules of IP sharing and the culture also of the university. So McGill is kind of generous. It gives 65% to the inventors or 35 to McGill. If McGill files it, if they decline to file it, you can still file it. And then you get 80% and McGill 20%, but that's uh, it's a very bad deal in many cases because if you want to spin off company and, and there's one person at the table has 20%, of the IP and, and maybe calls in the company of the revenue, uh, it, it can be very difficult. So, so it's something that you have to be careful. And, and I would say as students, often you have a better negotiation position than PIs because we are also employed by the university. So you know, we can't run away, whereas you as students, you, you're gone once you file your patent. So, um, or if you, or, or if, if you can't come to an agreement sometime. And then one other point is the one of conflict of interest. And this is something really for faculty. Uh, I know, I mean, I have, uh, and this is like for doctors here, as examples of doctors who is well known, they get also paid by pharma or oxy, oxy uh, the, the, something, the, the, the drug now, where they would, and even on, on institutional level, actually influenced by pharma. And so, so there can, and, and so this is, of course, a chance. So when you file a company as a spin off, sometimes you have share. So I, I for example, at Service where I didn't have share. And I didn't declare conflict of interest. And actually I didn't have share part because I didn't want to deal with this conflict of interest situation. And this came actually back to bite me because they're your spin off, so you help them. And, and conflict of interest, and even my chair at the time said, no, you don't have a conflict of interest and I have a letter stating that. In the end, the one who is responsible is you. So even if you've signed that, it doesn't mean that later on something can come and ask you again and something might make a different determination. So, so it's better to declare. You're not sure, declare. I mean, it's painful and, and then, you know, you declare and then by declaring everyone is covering themselves up because then if the university approves it, then you're protected. And then the university is the one who has to take. And so, so if you have nothing much to declare, then better declare preemptively. And so you have, you, you, you can avoid huge trouble. So for me, that meant, because then when we had NPLEX and I did declare it according to the rules, but then the question is, well, what about these two others sipping off from your lab? And then I said, well, I'm not part of that, but what do you mean? And, and then all these questions started to fall. And, and which actually had negative effects also on me and, and, and everyone, and it became, it became uh, uh, different. And so when you do also this commercialization, so on one hand, you're the hero, you're doing all this great thing, and the universities want to do that. And then suddenly you become the zero. You're the failure. You didn't declare a conflict of interest. You didn't manage it properly. And so this can be quite a roller coaster ride. And so, so be prepared for that. And yeah, take some distance and, and listen maybe to some other people who have had this kind of experience. Now, the conflict of interest has also a very uh, personal interest. So, you know, uh, so, and, and it, it's something that developed and it's something a living thing. And, and in the beginning, I didn't necessarily participate so much. So for example, wow, there's IP negotiations between the company and the, the, and the university. And so, you know, I said, well, I'm in a conflict. I, I don't want to participate then. And so, but now, 
the agreement comes back and now you see, wait, this agreement will kind of kill the company. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now, uh, I mean, let's just, or, or vice versa, the, the, the agreement, the company got a much too good agreement and it kind of kills the lab. So are you going to pay back to the to the, 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 the company and say, hey, no, I don't want that. So, you know, suddenly you're telling them, no, you didn't, I, I can't have this agreement. So actually you're supposed to be out of it, but in the end you can't really because you'll have to prove. And so, 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 so how to manage that is also a challenge. Um, so, so we had spin-offs in the like sensor reel and so on. Parallax, they were actually in the lab and, and did that to help. And I think it helped inspire students. Actually, Mawson told me that you know this was one of the things that inspired him, and that was one of the mentions. So they are there; they can have other students can benefit from it. And actually, students told me that was interesting. So both helping from their success and from their failures. And indeed, spin-offs are vulnerable in the middle. May seek your help, and some you know they say, "Oh, I don't have that. Can I have this?" And the lab and 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 yeah, of course you want to help them. We have no shares. I mean, it's kind of more you want to help them. Of course, it can also help your reputation, but it's no financial interest. Or you have share, you want to help them too. And so, I, mean, I you know from all the shares I've had, I haven't really any financial benefit from any of the spin-offs really so far. Uh, so you help them kind of in a more general sense. But uh, but so sometimes this one can be a little bit in conflict with your lab, and and maybe it's not real, but maybe the students even they perceive it as being in conflict in your lab. So you know even you're not doing anything, but the students still think you did something. Or my student is not happy with something else, and he thought you did something. And so these things is something that can be very challenging. And and so this is a and and also for example in the case for us with licensing, you now we have licensing agreement with three companies. And McGill didn't have much experience or didn't have a guidelines for that. And so these agreements are somewhat almost overlapping. And this becomes an IP thicket. And I think I had a point somewhere else with that. Um, but I'm not sure it is now. And so this becomes very complicated now to manage. And then the students get confused. And and and, and so it, it can become a challenge. And so so important is to really communicate and, and try to, to, to work it out. And then another thing in our case, student left spin off. So you know these were your students and you want to help them. But then suddenly they become the CEO, they become your boss, and then they want things from you, and so it can be a changing relationship. And so this can also readjust that, and finding the new situation can also something to do. And then our student-led company students have no experience, so so they leadership, like how they say, I mean, no, uh, the judgment, judgment is something that comes through false. It's something you learn through all the mistakes you make. When you start a company, you'll do a lot of these, and so being in that situation and having these students, well, they they I mean they do great, but yeah, and, and also every as the spin-offs grow, they have a changing role which they must manage all the time. Yes, and so uh, I'm just going to maybe skip a bit on that. So university regulations, for example, McGill, or finish this up. So McGill doesn't have regulations about spin-offs, so this leaves a lot of gray zones. And so spin-offs can be here, but it's the dean who accepts. So different deans from different faculty have different rules, and so this makes it very unclear. And that's part of the reason why then these things can 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 uh, can also be prompt. So better is to be transparent and try to work out. But you know it can also be very slow. Um, and and for example in Montreal, the challenge is that there's no there, there's a the incubator for wet lab are are fairly limited. So this creates additional pressure when you're here. So the licensing, yeah, that's what I said before. Uh, when you have licensing agreements, they can limit opportunities for new students. It's you know the past or the future students. I said uh, so the unfair sometimes actually are not right and and it's not not goodwill. Sometimes people don't realize and you know the, the patent officers they, they treat with 50, 100 comp that many different things, different fields, different practices. It can be different. It can be difficult. But I've seen that McGill student-led companies typically have better have been able to get more favorable licensing terms than actually faculty-led companies. So. Uh, and, and students, uh, I mean, the McGill wants to promote help their students, uh, of course, and so that's help, that helps too. And then IP rules have been changing. So because some people have abused IP rules, then now they make them more strict. And so that's something, you know, you have to keep on top. And so OTT office often typically they're short strapped. So that's another thing. And, and so McGill is actually fairly open, but I know some other institutions in Boston, I know or they're very strict and they're very aggressive. So even when you want to take your own IP, they're actually very aggressive in terms of that. And so just to finalize this, so um, BME is integrative and cross-functional. You know, we, we are at the center of this translation. We are, we are kind of, we know a bit of everything, but we are the ones who can integrate a lot of things. We can deal with the clinicians. We understand the, the marketing and manufacturing and design. We can talk to the guy in the basic. So we have a very opportunity, opportunity also in helping translate a lot of these things. 
And so we both, and, and that's a role we actually fill. We're fueling healthcare, we're fueling science advances. And we're also changing because as science advances, where we can make this kind of, you know, genetic engineering, immunoengineering, synthetic biologies, these are all engineering approaches that didn't exist 15, 20 years ago, but now we're becoming engineering fields. And so translation, I think for me at least, and for many, I know it means it's not just publications. I mean, publication, you can change science. It's, it's really where you think your work can have an impact. And of course, that's aspirational. And there's lots of things that are outside of your control and partnerships that are very important. And maybe to keep it in mind, I think part, you know, the, the, the road journey, so the experience, the learning, the new connections, I think it's part of the goal too. It's don't just think about being successful, take it also some experience in the journey and, and take it as a learning experience, basically, right? Especially when you're starting out and, and get some satisfaction out of that because most companies fail. And so I think it's trying again and, and, and so learning out of that that can and, and reflect a little bit. That. And finally, it's, it's about people, both in terms of who we recruit, who the companies are, how you deal with them, the relations. This is very key. And like investors, they say they, invo they invest in people as much as they invest into the companies. You know, as a PI, you're having all this thing and then you have the company and then you can't. So you do a poor, that's my situation. I feel like doing a poor job on every front. And uh, I'm not taking care of my family enough. I'm not taking care of my lab enough. I'm not taking care of the chair enough. I'm not taking care of the company. And so it can take a toll. So sometimes you just have to let go a little bit and yeah, step back and, uh, and, uh, and just take it a bit easy. And so I think with that, I want to stop here. I think I will be a bit over time here, but I'm happy to take oh, uh, some questions. Thank you very much, David. Very nice presentation. Uh, uh, very, uh, I mean, I mean, you uh, walked us through uh, your experience uh, right from the idea generation in your lab until the end where you develop these uh, these companies. And then even you went beyond and then shared some of the uh, challenges that you, you faced. Uh, this is something that uh, many researchers like us really need to uh, to understand before uh, we we think about starting a company. Uh, there is a trend there in in the field that uh, researchers really want to have uh, to start a company and then commercialize their product, but it's very good uh, for them to to know well before they start their uh, the commercialization process to know about some of the challenges that they may face. Uh, uh, we all, uh, I mean, we are we are scientists, but uh, we learn as we, we go on uh, by by uh, gaining experience, by communicating with the uh, uh, with IP agencies. We when we file IPs, when we go through the regulatory approvals. Uh, very interesting and inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, before we start the Q and A uh, section, uh, again, I would like to. Uh, uh, let everyone know that our next speaker is Dr. Hadi Shafi from uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, uh, he will uh, his talk will be next week uh, uh, at 12 uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time. Uh, we uh, also would I also would like to thank our uh, uh, sponsors again, uh, Revolution and uh, 4M Biotech. Uh, for uh, supporting these uh, e-seminar series uh, and feel free to contact us if you have uh, any comments and uh, feedback about these e-seminar series. So uh, why don't we start with, so uh, so the Q&A is, uh, we have two options. One is to raise your hand and then we will uh, unmute you and then you can ask your question. Uh, the other option is to uh, write your question in your in the question box, and then uh, then uh, I will uh, uh, again uh, I will uh, write, read your question to the to our speaker, and then we will hear uh, his answer. Uh, but before we start, uh, David, how much time do you, I know you're very busy? You're a chair, and then you're running uh, different things. So how much time do we have for uh, for the Q and A session? Yeah, well, let, let's get started. I mean, I'm happy to uh, I, I'm happy to answer the questions. Of course, I mean that's part I think of the opportunity of the audience to ask questions and get some feedback, and that's that's sure. the goal of also connecting sure. here. So what I'm going to do is we'll start <clears> with the, raise their hand. So maybe Human, you can uh, take care of this. Yes, thank you so much, David, for the interesting talk. Uh, just I want to uh, say to the participant that they have questions. Just please introduce yourself and uh, your institution and then ask your question. So uh, I unmute uh, Elham Salimi, uh, you could ask your question. 
Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yanker, for the interesting talk and the um, eye-opening, and interesting and eye-opening talk. So my question, I actually have two questions. One of them is regarding the SARS-CoV-2 detection strategy. So um, from, from what I understood, this is based on detecting the protein of the virus and not the antibody generated by the body, correct? So uh, <clears throat> thanks for asking the question. So I'm not sure I fully understood, but actually to, to, the, to one of the comments in your question. So, so the, the first test we did is an antibody-based test. The longer term, we are also interested to a viral detection test of the protein detection test using basically the same platform. And we have started working on it, but we don't have the, 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 the results to show that yet. And, and uh, potentially you could do both from the same saliva sample, which is what we see as an opportunity here. So my question is that for, for the virus detection one, given that like the limit of detection that I understood is about thousand copies of the virus, and like the limits that it could be useful for detection. So would there be enough proteins in terms of sensitivity of this kind of uh, affinity assays to detect that kind of low abundance uh, available protein? That's my first question. The second question that is also relevant to this one, but in the regard of the proteomic one. So one of the success of the genomic and transcriptomic uh, technologies coming from the ability of amplification. So given that with proteomic, we don't have that option. What do you think, what is your perspective of the way around? Because one of the, uh, on top of the challenge of cross-reactivity is just, we, we do not have enough of spe specific kind of proteins in a sample that you get from the body to detect it, either you need an extremely sensitive method or an amplification method. So what do you think would be, what was your perspective going in that direction of making proteomics scalable? Thank you. Okay, okay well, thank you so much, Alam, for the question. I think they're very, very pertinent questions. I think it's, uh, and I'll try to answer them to the best of I can. So the first question is about whether the, the, um, the given the low limit of detection that is needed for these uh, molecular assays, whether protein type of assays might be sensitive enough. And I think that's the general perception we see from clinicians, you know, that's the RNA is now the standard and why would we do protein assays? So there's, I think, two, two parts of that question. The first one is that when you do a protein assay, what you do is utilizing the virus. And so we looked a little bit into that. So when, when you realize the virus, you have one copy of RNA for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And if you look at the spike proteins, there's about 100 copies roughly per virus. And this is from the SARS-CoV-1. So just to realize this, you get an amplification factor of 100, right, off the bat, and that you get that in a matter of a few seconds, right? And so that's one way where you can improve the sensitivity. Now, the second aspect is, that protein technology, there have been some development in protein technologies where people go and, and detect individual binding events. And I think the, maybe the best known representative is David Walt's work uh, at the Wies Institute now, who developed this uh, also a commercial platform called Terex, which does detection of protein down to ato and femtomolar levels. And so, uh, so there is an opportunity for also uh, detecting uh, these samples, uh, the, these proteins at, at at levels that are much lower than what uh, one might think, uh, or what one conventionally thinks about, and, and that's actually approaching the limits of detection of PCR-based method. And then the third point maybe is that in the context of disease and also within the saliva sampling, there's actually a lot of false negative tests, even with the current uh, with the current nasopharyngeal swabbing. Like between seven, uh, I think the, the 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 false negative rate is up to 20 or 25 percent, if I'm not mistaken. And so there were actually studies that show that more testing at a regular interval is actually more recommended. So even if, if your protein test is slightly weaker, it might still be very, or not as sensitive as in a PCR test. It might still be, if it can be done quickly without waiting for the test to come back, especially if it's positive and the specificity is high, it already pre you don't have to wait for the, uh, the, the RT-PCR test to come back. You already can take that decision there, right? And if in the context of serial testing, or maybe you also want to test serially. And so we would have then basically do more studies to see, how, and depending also on the performance, whether the compromise there might still be uh, suitable for a test. And, and, and of course, these are things that would have to, to be studied on a larger way. 
Now, segueing into your second question, how we can, I know how, since we don't have, and it's kind of linked to your first question, how we should do proteomics technologies uh, to, to scale up since we don't have amplification. And I think that's exactly, uh, I mean, that's exactly the point. We don't have amplification. What should we do? Uh, should we just not do it? I, uh, and, and, you know, in, in some ways, diagnostics and these technologies are, of course, a bit the poor child. In many cases, people do a lot of things in therapeutics and mechanism and so on, and, and diagnostic technologies are not receiving the same resources. And which is why nowadays we have SARS-CoV-2 crisis and the technologies are being used as RT-PCR, which was developed in 1984, and the lateral flow assay, or 1983, and the lateral flow assay, which was developed in 1956. So clearly there is challenges and clearly we need we need to think about how we can address them. Now, what we have, so so, so we have done this approach and our performance now is, is with the, N, the, the, uh, like the NPLEX platform and also the other one is similar to ELISA and it's true for some applications, this is not good enough. And so we are taking, but we're taking one step at a time. So here we're addressing the multiplexing so we can at least do multiple measurements without compromising the actual performance. And the, uh, the, the the next step, indeed, if we want to have better performance, uh, it will also be to, or one of the next steps will also to be address the sensitivity of these assays. And, but there, as I was saying before, there are platforms that can have much higher sensitivity than what we have without actually the amplification. And then the last point I didn't really mention, I mean, we, we can scale up, but, but the reagents that we need for this are also a big challenge. So you know, there's for, for antibody pairs, there's 20,000 gene expression products. There's maybe 2,000 antibody pairs on the market for targets. So we need to develop also approaches that we can do that. On the other hand, with proteomics, we also have opportunities for functional assays. And this is something we're also looking to explore with our platform where you can look at, you know, not just whether protein is there, because that's one thing, but also if the protein has changed, has it been phosphorylated, has it been cleaved? And these are functional assays which traditionally have not been done with, with, uh, with immunoassays, but I think which we could also start exploring and, and, and just address actually a lot of unmet needs. Thank you so much, David. Uh, so uh, the next question from Mohammed Yulbar. Uh, could you please uh, introduce uh, your, uh, yourself and your institution and ask your question? Mohammad? Mohammad? Can you no, hear me? No. Yes. Okay. 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 Hello. Uh, thanks for your fascinating pre presentation, uh, Professor Yanker. Uh, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, the lab on chip uh, devices are tiny themselves, but the periphery is um, much bigger. So how do you think that we can eliminate the equipments uh, around the uh, chip themselves? So, uh, I don't know, syringe pumps and stuff, even uh, for uh, your new method of uh, uh, antibodies targeting over the previous sandwich method, some, some, sometimes you need long-lasting assays. Uh, so to avoid the evaporation or, or something, uh, as to my, to, to my basic knowledge, I think sometimes we need these peripheral equipments. Uh, how do you think that we can move toward uh, eliminating uh, dependency on uh, the peripheral equipments and uh, just uh, stressing on the chip themselves? Okay, well, okay, thank you for the question. Yeah, so that's exactly one of the questions of your, I, I, we are trying to address with our technology on one hand, so the capillary flow, where we encode all this complex functionality on the chip can help us answer that. Now to really fully realize it, what we would also need, and, and this has been you know, demonstrated essentially with lateral flow assays where you know, do a pregnancy test, so you apply the urine, you wait 10 minutes and you have your result, right? So it's sample in, answer out, and, and it's very simple. And this is what the potential for capital systems could do as well, but we can have, so it, it could maintain the form factor and the ease of use of a lateral flow assay, but we could have a complex series of steps which replicate essentially what the laboratory steps would be. And, and, and the attraction of our approach is that uh, all you need is basically a, a structure. It's all encoded into the structure. So this is something that could be fairly readily mass produced. Now, this is one approach. There could be other approaches, of course. The, and, and it's a bit of catch-22, so if, if in microfluidics, I mean, the, the input-output of sample is always a bit of a tricky part. 
And so, and, and so the model is, of course, like silicon chips, where you have a very complex technology, but because it became so widely deployed, very complex process became very cheap. And in microfluidics, the challenge is we don't have a standard technology. So let's say if you think about digital microfluidics, maybe you could have that potential where you could have a digital microfluidic system where essentially uh, you have to still integrate power supply and all these things, but you could have a chip that would run on its own with a very disposable electronics, a disposable power supply, and so on. But before this becomes cost effective, it would have to be produced into millions or, or billions. The problem is, before you can produce it in millions and billions, it's going to be very expensive and no one will want to buy it. So that, and that's this gap that we need to, to, to bridge. And that's where I think our technology, you know, it's maybe not as, it's not very flexible because you, once it's pre-programmed, you can't change it. But on the other hand, it's actually a technology where you could bridge that gap in, in, in an easier way. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know, David, uh, if you have uh, more time, we can take uh, some other question. Yeah, I, I, I should happy to answer a few more questions if uh... Okay, so uh, Masa from McGill has a question. Maybe Masa, you, you could ask yourself, I unmute you. Uh, Masa, please go ahead. Okay. So basically, uh, so I can read uh, her question uh, because she wrote it here, but I have to find it. So um, yeah, so she's talking about, uh, she wanted to know uh, what's your opinion about the future of e-beam lithography fabrication to pattern nanostructure fluidic devices in terms of applicability for larger scale production. Uh, okay, so, so e-beam lithography from microfluidic devices. So, uh, I mean, the short answer, I don't think this is a very, uh, it's going, well, I mean, it's okay for research and for doing like one, a few devices at a time, but if the goal is to make large numbers of devices, this is going to be very tricky. And it also uh, impinges on another challenge. You know, we, we, we speak a lot about microfluidics, but, and, and actually it, it uh, dovetails with the previous discussion, when you want to have to very high sensitivity, you actually need to process large volumes. For example, for bacterial detection, we want to detect one bacteria per milliliter. So it means if you want a statistical representation, you should actually process 10 milliliters so that you're sure that you actually have that bacteria. And then microfluidics is not your answer anymore because at this scale, the, 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 the volumes of channels are too small and it takes a long time to process these liquids. And so we have to think more, well, B types of assay that sample the entire volume are, are, are more effective. And so microfluidics has an opportunity. And so the bit of challenge because microfluidics, if it's very high concentration, well, you can just measure it, don't need to do anything. If it's very, very low concentration, you need large volumes. And so microfluidics is not the answer either. So microfluidics sits in the middle. It's good for the type of assays where you have fair number of proteins, which is like the, performance of common ELISA, but if you go at the like few copies per, per milliliter, well then you know you need actually to process large volumes. And then and so going making nanostructures with e-beam lithography is going really against this 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 trend, right? Because then that means you 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 can only do do high concentration. Now what you can do of course to study fundamental phenomena or uh, that that can be very helpful. But then in terms of mass production, e-beam is also something that is very slow. Thank you. So the next question from Dianush, uh, I unmute Dianush. Uh, you can go ahead. I can't unmute uh, from here, Mosen. Let me see if I can. Well, I, I unmuted Dianush, but I'm not sure. So it doesn't work. So Dianush, maybe you can write your question in the question box and then we can we can ask the question. Maybe you can try to unmute Elham on Johnny. So I can't, uh, there is a problem, <laughs> but we got some uh, uh, questions also here uh, from Sahil. Uh, so I just need to, yeah. 
So could you please uh, shed some light on the path ahead for omics-based diagnostics in terms of both hardware and software? Do you see any low-hanging fruit? <laughs> no, only, well, so the omics beyond protein, well, you know, so we, well, uh, low hanging, I, I, you know, I, I have the expertise in the protein assays, I, I follow a little bit in the other assays, I mean, what we clearly see is, uh, so uh, one of the transformation we have had this um, uh, uh, nanopore sequencing has been a long time, like a pipe dream, and, and you know, and it's also interesting because it, it was presented as this great thing, and, and billions of dollars were poured into that, and the results were really like 15 years before they came out. And so, you know, you have to wonder whether whether that was justified to spend all these resources in this field where at the expense of other fields. But having said that, nowadays we have Oxford nanopores and others uh, that, that have some interesting technology so, so that you could think of bringing sequencing to the point of care. Now, when you think about multi-omics detection, I think these are really research tools at this point. I mean, single cell sequencing, people start to look at proteins and and DNA, and, and there is big challenges uh, in terms of making these technologies work. There is, I mean, there's some some foundations have been established, but you know, the, I think there is room for for uh, for for transformative technologies. Now, in terms of particular, te I, I, it's hard for me to give specific sense beyond of the one I, I just said here. But uh, uh, and I think one would probably need to focus on one particular area to to be really able to make an impact. So because uh, these are all very complex problems, generally speaking. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know. There is a problem with the platform. We cannot unmute the participants. So I try to. Yes, Austin, please go ahead. I have a question. Uh, yes, <laughs> as an attendee. So, David, uh, what, when I was. So, I, let's, I, I'm a grad student, and I have. I think that at least I have this brilliant idea. So, what is your advice for me? What should I do? Who should I talk to first? You're a grad. Well, if, if you do the idea within the lab, you probably should talk to your supervisor <laughs> unless you want to run away with it. But first, the, 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 and, and typically your supervisor will also provide input into, into your idea. And that's actually an important point too with IP. You know, if you have to liaise with OTT, your supervisor, if he's already versed in that, he can help and facilitate and guide also, both in terms of the research and demonstrating it, as well as in the patent application. And so nowadays, when you do a patent, you have, at least in the, in the past, you could just have an idea and, and patent it. Now you have to have a reduction to practice, so you have to have it demonstrated. So, so if you're a graduate student, well, you, you probably, I mean, if it's, it's been a wet lab here and not just a, not an app, which you can go to program on your own. If you speak wet lab, of course, you will need resources and experiments to do that. And, uh, and, and generally speaking, what I, you know, most ideas, and it's always a challenge is they benefit, of course, from discussion between people and different inputs. And this is something, so discussing it with your PI and discussing it with your others and, it's probably going to help you, right? Because sometimes we want to just keep it to ourselves and get all the benefits for it. But uh, I think the winning strategy is more to share and, and to have more people and to rally people and create this enthusiasm and this community around this idea. And, and the same, actually, you know, mentioned same later on. I mean, you can when you start a company, of course, you want to. It's a balance between going uh, submarine underground, you know. And if you have been a successful entrepreneur, people you can do that and people will still buy you. But on the other hand, when you share your idea, there is a risk that people will also copy you or take some of it, but you can also get input. You can maybe some people tell you why it's a bad idea and then you don't have to waste your time. Or they, they, they give you new ideas. And often we're very afraid that you are so focused that your idea is so precious, but many often, you know, like the, the multiplexed assay, I mean, no one really cared about that idea for many years, I think. So you could say it and people, well, people didn't think it was important, didn't realize it was important. So you think the idea is the end, the, 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 the most important, the, 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 the next big thing after sliced bread. But for other people, sometimes this is just like one of many things. So, and so you have to a little bit uh, distance in there too. But so yeah, this, I mean, everything depends a little bit on the context. And of course, uh, building up the relationship and managing your supervisor is, uh, is one of the big uh, aspects too here. Okay, great, great. So, so the uh, take home message is that if you have a great idea, I mean, don't uh, hold it, <laughs> just uh, share it with your, with your supervisor 
and then get some feedback and make sure that I mean mm -hmm. uh, I mean pursue you can you, you pursue your dreams. Uh, this is something that will be very helpful. And the more feedback you receive from from experts in the field is uh, I mean puts you in the right path. This is this is something that uh, I learned at least uh, over the past few years from my mentors. Yes, I think uh, we are like half an hour past uh, okay. one o'clock. Uh, I uh, I would like to appreciate David that the space got uh, uh, more to answer the question. Of course, there are lots of questions that uh, was not uh, were not answered. So uh, we, I think we have to stop it here. So uh, I just wanna like uh, remind uh, others that uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Hadi Shafi'i from Harvard uh, Medical School. And uh, so we see you all uh, next.